So, a lot of people know me. They've been uh, checking out my stuff for a while. And there's a thread. What's that thread? Uh, about um, 20 years ago, um, I detected a potential error in our reality, you can call it what you want, reality, universe, whatever you want to call it. And um, what do I mean by error? Um, at first, I couldn't really put my finger on it. It was um, almost like a uh, bubble within a bubble kind of a feeling. Like there's um, there's something outside perception that's undetectable, yet the very uh, feeling of detecting it changes the uh, field of perception and then the bu bubble expands and then another bubble is created okay so um, you know how, how would that maybe compare to the you know let's say a common film like the matrix film or something like that you see the cat and there's the deja vu okay so that kind of that's an interesting idea on deja vu it's almost like Imagine you have someone inside a matrix, right? And they start feeling like they're inside a matrix. That very uh, fact of the feeling, so it's like the very fact of the feeling, then increases the, uh, not bandwidth, but almost like the server space of the matrix to potentially compensate for the uh, consciousness moving to a different area of the matrix because errors might occur if someone, let's say, entered into a part of the matrix which wasn't completed yet, right? That could create some a problem where uh, someone might, you know, have a 13th, 13th floor moment. If you haven't seen the 13th floor and you, and you like The Matrix, I recommend the 13th floor. It's an amazing film. <clears throat> but um, the error I found now, I didn't even realize was, um, I didn't even realize it was so fundamental to the situation we're all in because it actually has to do with the electromagnetic spectrum and the, uh, the the very fact that we exist in a uh, experience which is part it, it shares the electromagnetic spectrum okay and so um, you know you have light visible light heat uh, you know ultraviolet waves all these different forms of energy right and um, that is, you know, it's all part of something that we experience. So when I, you know, everybody's been noticing, I mean, there's been people all around the world checking out my videos on uh, radiometer research, and uh, there's been some great, absolutely great uh, interpretations of why the radiometer spins counterclockwise when it's cold, okay? Some people are saying, well, uh, you know, there's particles, they're moving around, it's particle impact per square inch. Uh, the others, are, you know, having good ideas saying that it's having a, relating to an equilibrium state. Um, I, I kind of tend to agree that there's definitely a uh, zero uh, equilibrium state and then it's, you're moving from one side of that spectrum to the other depending on the hot or coldness of the um, uh, area surrounding the radiometer right but what it's still um, what you still can't deny is that 
the radiometer stays at one point when it's at room temperature. It's not moving. It gets warmer and then it moves counterclock or clock clockwise. But when it's cold, it moves counterclockwise. And the problem is movement and especially rotational movement is um, harnessable energy. Now, this is, uh, I think this is the most difficult uh, concept to grasp of the whole thing, and it's just blown my mind, is um, how could a cold environment be a potential energy source? Part of me doesn't even want to believe it. I think that there is a actual um, I think there's an actual hardwired fail-safe program in our minds, maybe even genetic, deep, deep layers, genetic um, thing trying to block it. The idea that uh, something cold could turn into harn harnessable energy, even no matter how small. And um, it's e even for me that I'm mean, you know I think about it all the time. And it's a uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to even believe. So that's why um, you know that's why I've been just jumping straight into math, straight into you know I mean I'm I'm literally going through. I I already went through. Um, like grade school math straight up to junior high and then I'm just revisiting all this like algebra one algebra two stuff just so I can get to parabolics and like I'm not you know I'm not get doing this so I can um uh you know get into a, a um certain class in order to get some kind of certification it's like I'm really trying to uh, understand parabolas and three-dimensional parabolas in order to um, understand it like someone might understand um, a paintbrush who's an artist or you really understand that paintbrush or um, a mechanic might understand his or her tools because I honestly think that we're only using a very, very small um, percentage of the parabolic shapes uh, potential. I think it's, um, I mean, there's already extremely, amazingly awesome um, uses for three-dimensional parabolic dishes and all that stuff. I, I mean... I think that it's we're, we're just scratching the surface on it. So, um, yeah, so that's why I'm I've been doing what I'm doing, and um, part of me thinks that the. Um, Well, okay. Let's let's take it to it. Let's take it to the next step here. Let's say someone or a group of people were able to figure out how to have unlimited, um, or not unlimited. Let's just say inexpensive rotational energy, right? Just straight up inexpensive. Then there are secondary applications. So, uh, for example, the thing in uh, Britain where they're able to actually literally turn uh, 
carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide filled you know air into usable petrol which is a, basically a uh, another word for gasoline they're basically turning it polluted air into fuel okay but their bottleneck was electricity rotational energy plus a couple of magnets lined up plus copper wire gets you electricity add some you know resistors in there and uh, you can turn it from DC to AC and do whatever you need to do so I'm not um, you know I'm not trying to say that um, I'm completed anything in any way shape or form but what I am able to say is that I'm not even 40 yet and you know, there's probably a lot of people, you know, listening to this and like, dude, you're almost 40 year old. Well, to me, since, you know, I know how to teach, I can teach myself and other people how to have photographic memories. That's why, uh, you know, I made the game double memory. Like, everybody who played it had a better memory afterwards. It's just like, it didn't even take that long. They just sat down, you know, and... You know, I, I, do I have a completely photographic memory? No, but I taught myself how to have a much greater photo. I'd say it's like near, I'm basically like 65% when before I made the game, I was only about 20%. So, you know, I see something that I'm basically going to remember it in general. Um, I'm doing the same thing with learning math. I'm doing the same thing with understanding how... Uh, pixel artworks and all these things so eventually I'm going to get there it's not a matter of um, uh, when or no it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when and the thing about how I approach things is I'll create tools in order to make it so I'll learn faster and um, I don't know what else there is to say I mean Okay, let's take it. Let's take it another step. Let's take a, a parabolic mirror, right? Does a parabolic mirror, three-dimensional shape, have more um, energy than a series of flat reflective ones? Uh, well. I think the actual uh, fact that um, people in deserts are using parabolic trough shapes, like just like imagine you have little animals in a row eating out of the trough, they're just having all this pipes trans transmitting the energy down the row. The very fact that we have these trough shapes being used in mass production is evidence that somebody thinks that parabolics have value, right? Now, you go to the next step, the three-dimensional parabolic shape, you get that thing big enough. You can't even have a solar panel or an energy collector in the center because it's going to turn it into liquid. Your parabolic m mirror gets big enough. You, won't, you can't even have anything harnessed instrumentation because it, it's just going to melt the glass. It's going to burn the sensitive solar technology that's going to try and absorb the energy. It's going to melt it if it's, if it's a big enough mirror. So uh, my next step is to get my math level high enough so we can actually see what are the actual relationships in power intensity? And, you know, I know right now I could um, go online and look it up, right? I could just go online and look it up right now. But just being able to look it up doesn't have as much value to me as understand, truly understanding the relationship between the flat mirror, the parabolic trough, and the 3D parabolic. And um, that's why I think the uh, the far the far um, uh, what would that be 
high energy wavelengths of el the electromagnetic spectrum are going. But then you go back all the way to the other side with the absence of it. And that's, you know, that just blows my mind. Because, I mean, it almost means that cold, cold air, cold air, has tremendous energy potential, which is the opposite of what, um, you know, that's the complete opposite of what I've been brought up to believe. You think of hot air as having high energy potential, and the colder it is, the less energy it has. But now, if there's energy potential from this side as well as this side. I mean, that, that's why I'm excited. So, I uh, hope this was, um, you know, of value to you, and I'm not sure if, uh, you know, it will be, but, uh, you know, uh, any uh, comments or questions, I am open to discussing this, and um, I know it's kind of a um, arcane subject matter, but you know, I'm open to talking about it. Thank you very much.